Uh, good evening. Welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm very happy to be here. And I hope that soon enough you will be too. <laughs> so, the story so far. In 2003, I decided to read Proust. It took me seven years. I read it in French every morning at breakfast for about half an hour. And I have to say it was one of the best seven years of my life. <laughs> and as those of you who've read Proust know, the interval of reading Proust is immediately followed by something else um, that I call the desert of after Proust. <laughs> and it's a, a space of life where all you want is for Proust to go on. Um, but there is no more. And so for a while you kind of make do with other sorts of reading material, biographies, and uh, literary studies of Proust, and word indexes, and books by other people who write sort of similarly Proust, and it's all futile. There is no more Proust, and that's that. And eventually you accept this and settle back into the gray tedium of a life without Proust. <laughs> anyway, in that desert, I decided to prolong the experience of Proust for a while by doing some research. And I researched the character called Albertine, and wrote up my research in the form of 59 paragraphs, numbered paragraphs, as Noreen mentioned, which I will read to you. The Albertine Workout. I number my paragraphs for two reasons. One, it makes me feel like Wittgenstein. Two, uh -huh. from your point of view, the audience, to hear the paragraphs flashing by with numbers on them gives a sensation of hope. <laughs> <laughs> the Albertine workout. One, Albertine, the name, is not a common name for a girl in France, although Albert is widespread for a boy. Two, Albertine's name occurs 2,363 times in Proust's novel, more than any other character. Three, Albertine herself is present or mentioned on 807 pages of Proust's novel. Four, on a good 19% of these pages, she is asleep. Five, Albertine is believed by some critics, including André Gide, to be a disguised version of Proust's chauffeur, Alfred Agostinelli. This is called the transposition theory. Six, Albertine constitutes a romantic, psychosexual, and moral obsession for the narrator of the novel, mainly throughout volume five of Proust's seven volume in the Pleiad edition work. Seven. Volume five is called La Prisonnière in French and The Captive in English. It was declared by Roger Shattuck, a world expert on Proust, in his award-winning 1974 study, to be the one volume of the novel that a time-pressed reader may safely and entirely skip. <laughs> Eight, the problems of Albertine are, from the narrator's point of view, A, lying, B, lesbianism. From Albertine's point of view, A, being imprisoned in the narrator's house. Nine, <laughs> her bad taste in music, although several times remarked on, is not a problem. <laughs> Albertine does not call the narrator by his name anywhere in the novel, nor does anyone else. The narrator hints that his first name might be the same first name as that of the author of the novel, that is, Marcel. Let's go with that. <laughs> 11. Albertine denies she is a lesbian when Marcel questions her. 12. Her friends are all lesbians. 13. Her denials fascinate him. 14. Her friends fascinate him too, especially by their contrast with his friends who are gay but very closeted. 
Her friends parade themselves at the beach and kiss in restaurants. 15. Despite intense and assiduous questioning, Marcel cannot discover what exactly it is that women do together. This palpitating specificity of female pleasure, as he calls it. 16. Albertine says she does not know. 17. Once Albertine has been imprisoned by Marcel in his house, his feelings change. It was her freedom that first attracted him, the way the wind billowed in her garments. This attraction is now replaced by a feeling of ennui, boredom. She becomes, as he says, a heavy slave. 18. This is predictable given Marcel's theory of desire, which equates possession of another person with erasure of the otherness of her mind, while at the same time positing otherness as what makes another person desirable. 19. And in point of fact, how can he possess her mind if she is a lesbian? 20. His fascination continues. 21. Albertine is a girl in a flat sports cap pushing her bicycle across the beach when Marcel first sees her. He keeps going back to this image. 22. Albertine has no family, profession, or prospects. She is soon installed in Marcel's house. There she has a separate bedroom. He emphasizes that she is nonetheless an obedient person. See above on Albertine as heavy slave. 23. Albertine's face is sweet and beautiful from the front, but from the side has a hook-nosed aspect that fills Marcel with horror. He would take her face in his hands and reposition it. 24. The state of Albertine that most pleases Marcel is Albertine asleep. 25. By falling asleep, she becomes a plant, he says. 26. Plants do not actually sleep, nor do they lie or even bluff. They do, however, expose their genitalia. 27a. Sometimes in her sleep, Albertine throws off her kimono and lies naked. 27b. Sometimes then, Marcel possesses her. 27c. Albertine appears not to wake up. 28. Marcel appears to think he is the master of such moments. <laughs> 29. Perhaps he is. <laughs> At this point, parenthetically, if we had time, several observations could be made about the similarity between Albertine and Ophelia, Hamlet's Ophelia. Starting from the sexual life of plants, which Proust and Shakespeare equally enjoy using as a language of female desire. Albertine, like Ophelia, embodies for her lover blooming girlhood, but also castration, casualty, threat, and pure obstacle. Albertine, like Ophelia, is condemned for a voracious sexual appetite whose expression is denied her. Ophelia takes sexual appetite into the river and drowns it amid water plants. Albertine distorts hers into the false consciousness of a sleep plant. In both scenarios, the man appears to be in control of the script, yet he gets himself tangled up in the wiles of the woman. On the other hand, who is bluffing whom is hard to say. 30. Albertine's laugh has the color and smell of a geranium. 31. Marcel gives Albertine the idea that he intends to marry her, but he does not. She bores him. 32. Albertine's eyes are blue and saucy. Her hair is like crinkly black violets. 33. Albertine's behavior in Marcel's household is that of a domestic animal, which enters any door it finds open or comes to lie beside its master on his bed, making a place for itself. Marcel has to train Albertine not to come into his room until he rings for her. 34. 
Marcel gradually manages to separate Albertine from all her friends, whom he regards as evil influences. 35. Marcel never says the word lesbian to Albertine. He says, the kind of woman I object to. 36. Albertine denies she knows any such women. Marcel assumes she is lying. 37. At first, Albertine has no individuality. Indeed, Marcel cannot distinguish her from her girlfriends or remember their names or decide which to pursue. They form a freeze in his mind, pushing their bicycles across the beach with the blue waves breaking behind them. 38. This pictorial multiplicity of Albertine evolves gradually into a plastic and moral multiplicity. Albertine is not a solid object. She is unknowable. When he brings his face close to hers to kiss, she is 10 different Albertines in succession. 39. One night, Albertine goes dancing with a girlfriend at the casino. 40. When questioned about this, she lies. 41. Albertine is not a natural liar. 42. Albertine lies so much and so badly that Marcel is drawn into the game. He lies too. 43. Marcel's jealousy, impotence, and desire are all exasperated to their highest pitch by the game. 44. Who is bluffing whom is hard to say. See above on Hamlet. 45. Near the end of volume five, Albertine finally runs away, vanishing into the night and leaving the window open. Marcel fusses and fumes and writes her a letter in which he claims he had just decided to buy her a yacht and a Rolls Royce when she disappeared. Now he will have to cancel those orders. The yacht had a price tag of 27,000 francs, about $75,000 and was to be engraved at the prow with her favorite stanza of a poem by Mallarmé. 46. Albertine's death in a riding accident on page 642 of volume 5 does not emancipate Marcel from jealousy. It removes only one of the innumerable Albertines he would have to forget. The jealous lover cannot rest until he is able to touch all the points in space and time ever occupied by the beloved. 47. There is no right or wrong in Proust, says Samuel Beckett, and I believe it. The bluffing, however, remains a gray area. 48. Let's return to the transposition theory. 49. On May 30th, 1914, French newspapers reported that Alfred Agostinelli, a student aviator, fell from his machine into the Mediterranean Sea near Antibes and was drowned. Agostinelli, you recall, was the chauffeur whom Proust, in letters to friends, admitted that he not only loved but adored. Proust had bought Alfred the airplane which cost 27,000 francs, about $75,000, and had had it engraved on the fuselage with a stanza of Mallarmé. Proust also paid for Alfred's flying lessons and registered him at the flying school under the name Marcel Swan. Mm -hmm. The flying school was in Monaco. In order to spy on Alfred while he was there, Proust sent another favorite manservant whose name was Albert. 50. Compare and contrast Albertine's sudden fictional death by runaway horse with Alfred Agostinelli's sudden real-life death by runaway plane. <coughs> Poignantly, both unfortunate beloveds manage to speak to his or her lover from the wild blue yonder. Agostinelli, before setting out for his final flight, had written a long letter which Proust was heartbroken to receive the day after the plane crash. Transposed to the novel, this exit scene becomes one of the weirdest in fiction. 
51. Several weeks after accepting the news that Albertine has been thrown from her horse and killed, Marcel gets a telegram. You think me dead, but I'm alive and long to see you. Affectionately, Albertine. <laughs> Marcel agonizes for days about this news and debates with himself whether he could possibly resume relations with her, only to realize that the signature on the telegram has been misread by the telegraph operator. It is not from Albertine at all, but from another long-lost girlfriend whose name, Gilbert, shares its central letters with Albertine's name. 52. One only loves that which one does not entirely possess, says Marcel. 53. There are four ways Albertine is able to be not entirely possessed in volume 5 by sleeping, by lying, by being a lesbian, or by being dead. <laughs> 54. Only the first three of these can she bluff. <laughs> 55. Bruce was still correcting a typescript of La Prisonnière on his deathbed, November 1922. He was fine-tuning the character of Albertine and working into her speech certain phrases from Alfred Agostinelli's final letter. 56. It is always tricky, the question whether to read an author's work in light of his life or not. 57. Granted the transposition theory is a graceless, intrusive, and saddening hermeneutic mechanism, in the case of Proust it is also irresistible. Here is one final spark to be struck from rubbing Alfred against Albertine, as it were. Let's consider the stanza of poetry that Proust had inscribed on the fuselage of Alfred's plane, the same verse that Marcel promises to engrave on the prow of Albertine's yacht. From her favorite poem, he says, it is four verses of Mallarmé about a swan that finds itself frozen into the ice of a lake in winter. Swans are, of course, migratory birds. This one, for some reason, failed to fly off with its fellow swans when the time came. What a weird and lonely shadow to cast on these two love affairs, the fictional and the real. What a desperate analogy to offer of the lover's final wintry paranoia of possession. As Hamlet says to Ophelia, accurately but ruthlessly, you should not have believed me. 58. Here's the stanza of Mallarmé in English. A swan of olden times remembers that it is he, the one magnificent but without hope of setting himself free, for he failed to sing of a region for living when barren winter burned all around him with ennui. 59. Everything, indeed, is at least double. La Prisonnière, page 362. The end. <laughs> Not really the end. Because, here's what happens. You read Proust, you come to the end, you can't stand it. You do some research, you come to the end, you can't stand it. So guess what? Here I find, appended to the 59 paragraphs on Proust, 59 appendices, <laughs> of which I shall read to you a selection of the most useful. But first I have to get a bit of water because it's really dry and I'm running out of me. <laughs> Okay. Appendix four on Samuel Beckett. Habit, suffering, boredom, memory, tea drinking, tea biscuits, and the inscrutable banality of existence are topics Beckett and Proust have in common. They anatomize it differently. 
what is located in the head, the mouth, or the mind for Proust moves lower down the body in Beckett. For example, in the scene of dipping the Madeleine in tea, which transports Marcel to metaphysical reverie, Marcel's first swallow of tea is followed by a second and a third, for he wants to go on researching this unexpected bliss. Yet he is disappointed to find the sensation diminishes with repetition. He says, I drink a second mouthful in which I find nothing more than in the first. A third that gives me a little less than the second. Compare the tea drinking protagonist Murphy from page 49 of Samuel Beckett's novel of that name. The sensation of the seat of a chair coming together with his dropping posteriors was at last so delicious that he rose again at once and repeated the sip, <laughs> lingeringly and with intense concentration. Murphy did not so often meet with these tendernesses that he could afford to treat them casually. The second sit, however, was a great disappointment. Beckett is, generally speaking, more interested in the posteriors of the body than Proust. See, for example, Beckett's character Pym, stabbed in the bum with a can opener, or Crap lamenting his bowels while he goes on eating bananas, or the wealth of anal discourse in Murphy, or the extensive excrementalizing of the world in the diction of Latimer and Estragon, not to mention Beckett's own renaming of the publishers Chateau and Windus, who rejected his collection of poems in 1934, as shut upon and wind up. <laughs> Appendix 15A on adjectives. Adjectives are the handles of being. Nouns name the world. Adjectives let you get hold of the name and keep it from flying all over your mind like a pre-Socratic explanation of the cosmos. Air, for example, in Proust can be, adjectively, gummy, flaked, squeezed, frayed, pressed, or percolated in book one, powdery, crumbling, embalmed, distilled, scattered, liquid, or volatilized in book two, woven or brittle in book three, congealed in book four, melted, glazed, unctuous, elastic, fermenting, contracted, distended in book five, solidified in book six, and there seems to be no air at all in book seven. <laughs> I can see very little value in this kind of information, but making such lists is some of the best fun you'll have once you enter the desert of after proofs. <laughs> Appendix 15b on adjectives. But let us not overlook the suggestion made in 1971 by that late-born pre-Socratic philosopher Roland Barthes, namely to craft a language with no adjectives at all, thereby to outwit the fascism of language and to maintain the utopia of suppressed meaning, as he deliriously puts it. When I used to play prisoner's bass in the Luxembourg as a child, says Barthes, what I liked best was to free all the prisoners, putting both teams back into circulation and starting the game over at zero. Clearly these are waters too deep for a mere appendix to attempt, although I recommend to your private inquiry, Roland Barthes' lifelong uneasiness with competition, his mistrust of binary situations, and his dreamy commitment to a third language in which we would all be exempt from meaning. <laughs> Appendix 17 on the second paradox of Zeno. The people Marcel loves are people in motion, like Albertine, always speeding off somewhere on a bike, on a train, in a car, on a horse, or flown out the window. Like Marcel's mother, perpetually on her way up the stairs to kiss him goodnight. Like his grandmother, who strides up and down the garden every evening for her constitutional, even when it's pouring rain. Or like his friend Robert St. Lou, whom we first glimpse scampering along the top of the banquette in a restaurant to fetch a coat for Marcel, who sits huddled and shivering at a table. 
Marcel is the still center of all this kinetic activity. He is like the flying arrow in Zeno's second paradox, which is shot from the bow but never arrives at its target because it does not move. Why does Zeno's arrow not move? Because, is this Aristotle's explanation, the motion of the arrow would be a series of instants, and at each instant the arrow fills the entire space of that instant, and this, Zeno would say, is a description of stillness. So if you add all the instants of still together, you still get still. No one would deny that Proust's novel streams with time and with arrows shooting in all directions. But you could also think of the whole thing in your mind as one big stopped instant, since it takes Marcel the entire 3,000 pages of the story to get around to the point of beginning to write it. On the last page, he shoots his arrow. But he does Zeno one better. He shoots it backwards, since you have just finished reading the novel he is proposing to write. It gives me a bit of a headache to think about Zeno and his paradoxes for very long, although I enjoy his deadpan delivery. Here is a shot of Zeno antidote from that devoted Proust scholar, the filmmaker Chris Marker. This is from his film Sans Soleil. That is how history advances, plugging its memory as one plugs one's ears. But a moment stopped would burn like a flame of film blocked before the furnace of the projector. Appendix 19 on St. Cecilia. Albertine is a person in motion, see Appendix 17. And her ability to flee or evade Marcel forms a significant part of her desirability. Even when he watches her sitting still playing the piano, he imagines her legs and feet on the pedals as the legs and feet of a girl on a bicycle, bumping up and down. He then compares her to St. Cecilia, patron of music, seated at the organ. This analogy can be traced to an article Proust wrote for Figaro in 1907 about his travels in Normandy with his chauffeur Alfred Agostinelli, whom he likewise compares to St. Cecilia, the saint of the organ. Appendix 20 on speed. The speed limit in 1907 in France was 15 kilometers per hour. When he drove Proust around Normandy, Alfred Agostinelli must at times have exceeded this limit, for according to the 1907 article in Figaro, to drive with Alfred was like being shot from a cannon. <laughs> Alfred's driving costume consisted of a rubber mantle and rubber hood, which Proust says made him look like a nun of speed. <laughs> Appendix 21 on nuns. <laughs> the small important cake called a madeleine was invented by a deposed king of Poland whose pastry chef's name was Madeleine. Subsequently, madeleines were made by an order of nuns using the original recipe until the French Revolution abolished convents. Nowadays, you can get the recipe from Julia Child or off the web. <laughs> it is an odd and probably accidental fact that the other famous Madeleine of our cultural heritage, the heroine of Hitchcock's Vertigo, falls to her death from a church tower at the end of the film because she is startled by a nun. We might in general wonder how familiar Hitchcock was with Proust's novel. Certainly the movie plunges us into problems of memory and time while featuring a heroine who dies twice and whose desirability is secured by constant lying, or we could say one gigantic bluff. At the same time, it would be nice to think that Proust somehow saw vertigo. <laughs> <laughs> Since the final moments of his novel are so gripped by this sensation, here is Marcel on the last page contemplating the task of writing before him. A feeling of vertigo seized me as I saw below me and yet within me as if I were miles high 
so many years of time. Appendix 29 on kimonos. Knowledge of other people is unendurable. Japanese kimonos were in style in Paris in the 20s. They had been redesigned for the European market with less sleeve and more pocket. Albertine keeps all her letters in the pocket of the kimono that she so carelessly tosses over a chair in Marcel's room just before falling asleep. The truth about Albertine is that close. Marcel does not investigate. Knowledge of other people is unendurable. Appendix 32 on slavery. Marcel's use of the phrase heavy slave bothers me. A certain master-slave tonality in Marcel's relationships with other people overall bothers me. What makes a slave heavy? Does she have a heavy skin, heavy step, heavy jokes, heavy childhood? Does she come from a heavy nation or adhere to a heavy philosophy of life? Does she speak with a heavy accent? Does she have a heavy reason for doing everything you tell her? Does a heavy slave imply light master? Let's say you want to get rid of the slave. Do you use a heavier weapon than you need for the master? Or will any light to medium implement do, say a runaway horse or an early winter? How about bluffing the slave into thinking she's winning the game you play every day with the kimono and the trick questions? Do you have the stamina for that? And will you miss it when it ends? And how do all these things bear upon the difference between metaphor and metonymy? Sorry, this appendix got away on me. <laughs> appendix 33A, on the difference between metaphor and metonymy. Since this question has arisen, here's the difference. <laughs> In a group of children asked to respond to the word hut, some said a small cabin, some said it burned down. <laughs> <laughs> Appendix 33b, the difference between metaphor and metonymy. Now that I give that second thought, the difference between a small cabin and it burned down doesn't illuminate a thing about metaphor and metonymy. <laughs> it does, however, speak to the fragility of the adventure of thinking. The day I decided to figure out metaphor and metonymy once and for all, I went to the library, got an offer of books, read different parts of all of them, wrote some wild notes on scraps of paper, and went home, hoping to sort out my notes the following day. The following day, among my notes, which by then had somehow become disorganized and unintelligible, I found this haunting and exemplary small cabin that may or may not have burned down. Mm -hmm. And although I couldn't remember its context, had neglected to record its provenance, and didn't really grasp its relevance for metaphor and metonymy, the small cabin called out to me not to forsake it. <laughs> it remains a very good example. We just don't know of what. <laughs> <laughs> Appendix 34 on getting rid of your slave. It occurs to me that a novelist has the option to disenfranchise, disempower, or delete his slave grammatically by taking away the part of speech in which she acts as a subject connected to a predicate. So Marcel's ultimate reference to Albertine on the last page of the novel is a sentence without a main verb. Profound Albertine whom I saw sleeping, and who was dead. Appendix 40 on sleep theory. It has been a philosophic cliche since Heraclitus that human beings in general are sleepwalkers. That is, he says, most people spend their lives asleep. And only the special man, that is, a certain kind of philosopher, that is, Heraclitus, <laughs> is properly awake and alert. 
But this is not the distinction Proust wants to draw. He woke swept aside by something that had passed on the wrong shore and his heart broke. He lay puzzled by this, then got up to write a letter. Dear Heraclitus, he wrote, theory is good, but it doesn't prevent things from existing. Appendix 53 on the bluff. Bluff, the noun, means in English originally the blinker for a horse, as for example in its earliest recorded usage by a certain Darwin in a paper entitled Squinting, published in 1777. Bluff, the verb, of etymology quite unknown, was used from as early as 1674 to mean to blindfold or hoodwink an animal, or to impose upon an opponent as to the value of one's hand at cards in poker. Bluff the noun and bluff the verb may be translated into French as le bluff and bluffé, respectively, anglicisms. Proust avoids the verb bluffé, but uses le bluff three times of interactions between Albertine and Marcel. He points out the difference between bluffing in poker and bluffing in love, namely that a card game is played in the present tense, and all that matters is victory. But love reaches into past and future and fantasy. Its suffering <coughs> consists in positing to those realms all that the bluff conceals. Appendix 59 on a bad photograph. In a celebrated biography of Proust, Tadier's, is a small, poorly reproduced 1907 photo of Proust and Alfred Agostinelli seated in their motor vehicle, dressed for a journey. Proust, swathed in a great coat, one leg crossed over the other, looks puffy and already bored with wherever they're going. Agostinelli is gripping the steering wheel, suited up in his nun of speed costume, with eyes fixed fiercely on the horizon. It would be one of those photographs that arouses merely a docile interest and is then forgotten. As Bart says, a photograph with no fissure, no punctum to draw you in and disturb you. Except for the posture of Alfred Agostinelli's head for he has thrust his head back at an angle suggesting the velocity of their forward motion. But of course they are sitting stock still in the car. You cannot help but wonder if it gave him a pain in the neck to hold his head that way for the numerous minutes of the exposure. Or what the two of them talked about under their breath that day as the photographer fiddled with his lenses and the cicadas sang in the hawthorn hedge, and a summer afternoon at the farthest edge of human love extended itself before them into, apparently, eternity. Maybe they discussed a small cabin. Maybe it burned down. <laughs>